22 games left for the Indiana Pacers, and they're probably not making the plan. They're definitely not making the plan, but what should they focus on for their final stretch of this season? How do they maximize these last handful of games? We're going to talk all about it today on the Locked On Pacers podcast. <laughs> You are Locked On Pacers, your daily Indiana Pacers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to another edition of the Locked On Pacers podcast, where we, of course, talk about the Indiana Pacers as always. My name's Tony East. I cover the team for Forbes and the West Side Community News. And today, I can't believe it. It's been 10 days. The Pacers finally are back in action tonight against the Oklahoma City Thunder in a tank-tastic game, which will be very important down the stretch of the season. And I say that to say that's what we're talking about today. The Pacers have 22 more games, and their focus for a lot of it's going to be maximizing the lottery, but it's also going to be figuring out what they have with their team, figuring out what they need to focus on in free agency this summer, getting everything squared away. These last 22 games still matter and are very important. And joining me to talk about these final 22 games from the Journal Review Sports and Indy Sports Legends, you've seen him all over the place at Pacers games. Mr. Tyler Smith himself also covers IU basketball, unfortunately, this season. Tyler, how's it going? It's going well. How are you? It's it's going good. It's sleeting outside, and I hate winter, so I've been in better moods before. But basketball will certainly cheer me up. And that's an easy. This is an easy segue into what the rest of the season is for the Pacers. And I've kind of mentioned in a lot of these shows during the All Star break, but they have a bunch of new pieces, some of which might be around next year, some of which might not be. They have some vets that were part of the old era, some that were on the team as soon as 2015. And I think these last 22 games are going to be fascinating for the Pacers, trying to figure out who should be on this team long term, what young guys fit and don't fit together, how do they maximize their draft position within that. They just hired Rick Carlisle. It's going to be hard to just be like, we don't want to win any of these games. So I tasked Tyler and I myself came up with three things the Pacers should be focusing on down the stretch of the season. I imagine we'll have some overlap. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? Well, all I have is lose games, lose games, and lose games, but... (laughs) I figured We're done. Out. That's it. Good. Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> Quick show. That was good. <laughs> yeah, we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, I'll jump in first. And I guess I'm guessing something like this is on everybody's list. But my first one, and I think my most important thing for the Pacers to figure out in their last 22 games, how well do Malcolm Brogdon and Tyrese Halberton fit together? And Brogdon is probable to play against OKC tonight. Uh, I would say he's going to play, but with Brogdon, you never know. You never know. So until he's playing, I don't know. But with Brogdon just getting his extension last summer, him being the best pacer left after the deadline, him possibly being the best pacer next year too, in my head and in a lot of people's heads, Hal Burton's a point guard and Brogdon should be out the door. I think Brogdon can fit with him. I talked about that with Greg Doyle yesterday. I think Brogdon's very good. He was off ball in Milwaukee and very good. And if they can fit together, they, the Pacers can be good with both on the floor. Kevin Pritchard said it as presser. We're not rebuilding. We want to bounce back and be good next year. If that's the case, one would think Brogdon would be on the team next year. But if it turns out that Brogdon, who came here wanting to be a point guard, and Halberton don't necessarily fit great together in these last 22 games, and that's a small sample, maybe not enough to make any declarations. But if they don't fit well together, that certainly seems like a reason to up the pressure on a trade of Malcolm Brogdon and finish off getting rid of all the high-value vets they had at the deadline, what do you think about that? How do you feel like they need to maximize that pairing? Yeah, that was actually number one on my list as well. So oh, I, I know oh. I know you and Greg talked about it a little bit, but I think, I mean, it's incredibly important. I think things worked out really well for the Pacers after the deals. Um, I think it was well-timed that uh, Brogdon missed some games. Halliburton could come in and kind of run the show on his own. Uh, Malcolm Brogdon had a front row seat to watch Halliburton run in the show, which could be important too. Um, but, you know, you mentioned uh, some things Kevin Pritchard said, and, and Rick Carlisle actually said that he used the words perfect compliment. So take it with a grain of salt or maybe it means something. I don't know. But, you know, they, they got to see if it works. Um, as you said, not a huge sample, especially if Brogdon misses more time later as we go here. But um, I think a big part of it's just going to be Brogdon, you know, his his attitude towards it. Will he play off ball? I am one of those uh, in the category of, you know, Halliburton needs to be the one long-term. I mean, 
couple sets here and there per half. Maybe he's off ball, but man, I just love watching him play and I love how he sets up the offense. And and I, I like you, I do believe Brogdon can play off ball and, and they can fit together. But I don't know if uh, Kevin Pritchard has a good idea of what he wants to do already or if these last 22 games will have a big uh, determining factor in that. Lavert and McConnell and Duarte, whoever else you want to throw in there, they could all play make a little bit, but not enough that you're like, we got to move Malcolm to a different role or like change how we're doing things. You know, I thought Lavert should have had the ball a little more, but nothing, nothing crazy. Halliburton, not only is he the best passer they've had in, in God, <laughs> a Halliburton. long time, <laughs> a long time. Um, he's also 21 and will be the face of this franchise possibly now, but possibly as soon as like the middle of next season. So that's different. That's like you you start to relinquish responsibilities for guys. And if they're not willing to, you have to think about how they fit on the future of this team. So, yeah, I think that's what it's going to be for, for Malcolm. And I, I think that there's a way. You know, we saw this with Levert at times. Okay, Halliburton's out. Brogdon's in every time. And that hurts TJ McConnell's future. That's a different conversation. But then he can still have his point guard duties and be playing with Halliburton in a way that maximizes both. And if that's possible, if they're all on board with that. I think that's the best way to do this. But if he wants to run it all, and Halliburton can shoot, so it's not like he'll be bad off ball, but the future of this team, I think, suggests he should have the ball as much as possible. So if Brogdon is willing to sacrifice even just a little bit when he's playing with the starters, and then he can still be the guy running things with the bench. And again, now McConnell's suddenly the guy getting squeezed, and he's not playing right now, whatever, but maybe you have to figure out his role too. That's what I think the best path forward is. So for Carlisle, it's going to be about, one, I want to see as many, me, the data guy, wants to see as many Brogdon Halliburton minutes as possible. So they suck, even if it's if it, even if it's how we both think it should be, where Halliburton has the ball the most. Even if those minutes go terribly, then you're like, oh, what's the point? Mm -hmm. And then two, if you have a lot of minutes and they go awesome, then you're like, oh, we just extended this guy for three years. Great. We're ready to be the team Kevin Pritchard thinks we can be next year. So I want to see a lot of them together, and then I want to see Brogdon running the point with the bench a lot too. I think that's the ripple effect from it, because then they have as many data points as possible to say this is our guard rotation for next season. Yeah, what I just don't want to have, have happen is another uh, Turbona situation. Surely we're not getting to that point, but, you know, a, a fan base divided of, oh, you can stagger the minutes and this guy's better than you. I mean, I don't think that's going to happen, but obviously a little gun shy from that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I agree with you making uh, having them play together as much as humanly possible. Um, definitely one of the keys moving forward here. Well, the, the difference between Turbonus and them is, you know, well, there's obviously, you know, center is a little harder to like play a different position than center. Like they can play two guard or even Brogdon's case. He played the three sometimes in Milwaukee. Yeah. He's tall enough to do it. But the biggest difference is what Turbonus, they're both the same age, right? So a lot of the discussion was like, who do you build around? Who do you pick going forward? We're like, Brogdon's 28 and Halliburton's 21. There's no discussion about which one you choose on a long-term, short-term approach, right? So I don't think that will happen. The Pacers fans have have never been short of surprises for 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 me before. So how do you see McConnell fitting in all this? I, and we well, we don't know this. Like he was in a sling at their last game before the break. Like he could not play this year. And then it's even harder to evaluate their point guard rotation next year. But you know if if and this is my idea, Brogdon's your backup one to maximize Halburn. Now now what do you do with McConnell? I mean he's a good vet, but he's getting paid like a guy who should be playing every game. It's going to be interesting. I mean, I know how much uh, Kevin Pritchard loves TJ McConnell. Um, I know how much a lot of the fans love the guy. I don't think he's going to play the rest of the year. So it's it's going to be tough. Um, then, you know, obviously summertime comes around. They've got a little money to spend. They, you know, how do they, uh, whatever pick they end up, you know, having in that first round, maybe multiple, Um you know, do they get, do they bring in another guard or combo type guard? And then all, you know, things complicate even more. Um, I know even maybe unpopular opinion, but I don't even think there's a guarantee that a Chris Dorte type is a for sure starter moving forward. I mean, if they draft a stud guard and goes with Halliburton, maybe Brogdon's still here. Maybe you get a, you know, a free agent guard. There's all kinds of possibilities. Uh, I think the cool thing about this little rebuild or retool, whatever you want to call it, the Pacers have a lot of pieces here that could actually make a nice little second unit. I mean, if, if that's what it comes down to, and, and even if some of these guys aren't uh, starters long-term, um, the Pacers have struggled you know, with the second unit for many years, and that could be a good thing. But I think moving forward, Halliburton as the one might be the only lock as far as uh, yeah. long-term of, of what this 
you know, roster is going to look like. So, but the good news is unlike, I, I was thinking this the other day when the, you know, you know, I'm a Cubs fan and, and when the Cubs were rebuilding back, like in 2013, it was just terrible to go to the games and think there's nobody on the field. That's even part of the future. The Pacers have a couple for sure's and then several that several maybes. And that's a, uh, that's pretty intriguing um, as we watch these last games here to, to think that a lot of these guys could be part of the future. Yeah, and we're, we're 10 minutes into the point guard rotation discussion and maximizing Brogdon plus Halburn. We even said Lance's name, who's been the backup one for like two months. You know, yeah. and, and with McConnell out, there's still minutes for him. It's not like this fan favorite's just going to like vanish into thin air. But next year, it's like, okay, maybe we want him back for the, the allure to keep people interested because we sucked last year. But like, there's no rotation spot for him at all with what they have right now. So step one, obviously, figure out Brogdon Halliburton. But after that, I think figuring out your bench guard rotation is the ripple effect from that that will be really challenging. My objective would be figure out how Brogdon can lead a second unit. But I get how the Pacers could say, let's figure out what we have with all these guys. Hey, guys, one short little break here to talk about two awesome groups of people. First up, the good folks over at Truebill, because do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 per year with Truebill because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel. But Truebill makes it simple. You link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And you have a Truebill concierge there to help you when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions for you so you don't have to. They have over 2 million users and have helped them save over 100 million in total. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today. Truebill.com slash locked on NBA. Go right now. Truebill.com slash locked on NBA. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash locked on NBA. Let's also talk about the great people over at rockauto.com because with the ever increasing numbers of makes and models of vehicles, it is impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that your car is going to need. You got to go in there, try to find it. It's going to be in the wrong aisle. It's not going to be labeled right. You got to go behind the counter. They're not going to have it. They don't know the specs of your car. They got to order it. This is based on a true story. Instead, you can use your computer or your phone and go to rockauto.com right from your pocket or your house, and you can save time and money by doing so. 30%, 50%, even 100% savings for the same parts. And rockauto.com is a family business who's been serving do-it-yourselfers for over 20 years. Their prices are always reliable for every customer, and they have everything you could need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, new carpet. You need it. They got it. Go explore their website today and figure out what they've got for you. Go to rockauto.com right now. See all the parts available for your car or truck right locked on in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. All right, let's pivot to thing number two. I went first last time and ruined your first one, so you're <laughs> going now. Thing number two, Pacers are focusing on for the rest of this season. Thing number two is to play deal or no deal every night, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I need to actually start tracking which case is the 500 and see. Because they actually swapped it their last game before the yeah, rest. So they're changing them, <laughs> so now I want to do like a, an actual study of which one it is. Um, yeah, so I was thinking about this. I... I was trying to think how to word it exactly for this uh, second point because it's kind of broad, but we we touched on the fact that there's just so many guys that could be part of the future. There's guys auditioning for jobs. You know, you got the Washington Junior, Taylors, Jalen Smiths of the world. Um, they obviously need a lot of playing time to see what you have, but then you got other guys as well. O'Shea Brissett, is he, is he becoming a dude? I mean, he could be coming a dude. He's looking pretty good lately. Um, then you got Jackson and Goga, and you got all these guys – you could even throw in Miles Turner and TJ Warren into this list of they could be here next year. They could be moved. We don't really know. Um, but for me, I guess the way I would word it is if I'm the Pacers, if I'm Rick Carlisle, I am mixing and matching like you wouldn't believe in these last 22 games. I'm figuring out as much as I can, um, treating it almost like preseason in a way, because, again, the losses are, are a good thing. But. Um, and that's hard to do, though, as a coach. When you're in the heat of the moment, you're going to try to win that night. So that's, uh, you know, who knows if uh, how they'll treat end-of-game situations especially. But I'm trying to figure out how many positions can can everybody guard. Um, 
combinations of guys, you know, obviously the, the, the big one that we talked about, but um, mix and match to death, you know, make things where it doesn't even make sense sometimes because you really got to see what you have moving forward. I think you and I both expect a, a busy summer of, of more action, more yes. move for this team. Yes. So there's a lot of guys. It's like, all right, where do they fit? Because uh, a lot of them look like NBA players and that's exciting, um, but you're not going to have a spot for all of them, you know, next year. So really do a deep dive, figure out what you have. Yeah. To the tanking and losing point. I mean, I heard this somewhere else, but it really resonated with me. Someone said like players don't tank and coaches don't tank organizations tank, right? Like if, if Rick's got guys and it's a close game, he's playing the best five guys at the end of the game. Right. The organizational tanking is the crap you see where like Eric Bledsoe hasn't been hurt all season and the Blazers are like, oh, he's Achilles is sore. He, you know, he's not. It's like, okay, that is that that's what they mean by that quote. So Rick's going to try every game to do his best with what's available and the players are going to try their hardest, whatever. Okay. But to what you're saying, you know, I think what my my biggest part of that would be, and they're already kind of doing this, is like O'Shea Brissett playing the three a little bit now. Okay. Isaiah Jackson, play the four a little bit now. You know, Get these guys in other positions and see what works there because that allows you to mix and match the most and allows you to know what positions you can build w- your team around. You know, if you have no wings at all, if O'Shea's terrible at the three next to your best players, you're like, oh, crap, we need wings really bad. If he's better there, you don't need that. You know, and so that beyond what you're saying of evaluating the team and getting the lineups together, you know, what you need better in free agency by doing that, too. So I agree 100 percent. Mix and match this team to death. Get lineups out there that never play together. I want to see Jackson plus Turner really bad, really bad. I think that would be a very fun combo to see defensively if either of those guys can play the four a little bit, mostly Jackson. But, you know, that's something Pritchard lauded before the season and even put Brissett at the three. Go go mega huge. Why not? You know, I want to see those kind of combos our season. I think that's a good point. Yeah, my one exception may be, I don't know if your um, opinion has changed at all on Jalen Smith, a very small sample size, but <laughs> – He's got some talent. He's looked pretty good. My thing is, though, I would be very tempted if I'm the Pacers to, I mean, you want to see what he can do, but you don't want him to play. If you, if uh-huh. you like him in the future, you don't uh-huh. want to see him play himself out of Indiana and get this big contract offer somewhere. So maybe kind of limit his minutes. I know it's kind of weird, but. It sucks for him. It totally sucks for him. Jalen, the best way for you to stay on the Pacers is to never, never play. <laughs> Just sit over there. <laughs> a little bit. Show a little flash for the future, yeah. but yeah, nothing too big. <laughs> well, and, and, you know, we, we saw – before the break, like Terry Taylor's ahead of Jalen and Rick's eyes. And I think that's the right choice. And so when they get everybody back, I don't know if there's a role for Jalen Smith unless Rick's like, oh yeah, I think he's better than I, Jackson, Goga right now. Then there's a role for him. So we'll see. My segue I just led it to is Goga. And I just wrote his name. This is a last 20-something games figured out for the Pacers. Who and what is Goga? What, what can you do with this guy? How does he fit into the puzzle of your team. If there's a game he does not play the rest of the season, even one game, uh, there's no point of having him on the team next year. Yeah. Not a single point. You know, if you can't find a role for him with the team they have right now, then there's no way he's going to be on the team next year. So uh, figure it out with him now, right? The, the reasons he's not, I mean, he gets hurt all the time. He was hurt right before the break, but the reasons he wasn't playing are now gone. They finally split up the double bigs. He was playing before the break. He had two good games against Minnesota, and I forget who they played after Minnesota. Milwaukee. So, you know, build off that. Try to play him with other bigs. Play him a lot. You know, I might, it might hurt Jackson's minutes a little. I'm okay with that personally if I'm the Pacers because I have to know now. You know, I, yeah. I kind of have tried to find, figure out what Goga is and who I can play him with, but I have to know before the summer if this is a guy I want to find rotation minutes for or if this is a guy that I want to use in some sort of deal so I can clear up minutes for Isaiah Jackson or, or figure something else out at center because – They've they they've been trending towards kind of knowing, but they've never known. And now is their first chance to really know. I think they have to take take advantage of it. Yeah, as long as he's healthy, he's got to play and and play quite a few minutes. I think down the stretch, um, unless the only thing I can think of is if they come to this conclusion that he's a really good third string center who, that you want to have around for the inevitable time that Turner or Jackson or whoever else they have misses some time, you can plug him in, but. I don't know if he's going to really fit the way that the pace they're playing. And um, he's looked, uh, he's looked a little slow and and I don't know. It's just, you know, we see flashes as you said, and it, it just kind of looks like um, he's going to be a, a solid backup, but other times it's like third string at best. So I definitely agree. Get him on the court, see what he can do. 
That's part of my Jackson at the four idea too, is that allows you to get Goga on the, on the court as much as I think you'll need to, to really evaluate him. And I think a lot of fans have already hit the like, nope, we know, you know, he's not that good. And I understand that, I guess, but like he, he's had really good games. I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it, but I feel like he's had really good games in his career before. Like he himself has had that 20 and 10 game that Isaiah Jackson had. Uh, you know, what, what's to say that that wasn't just the flash in the pan kind of stuff? I don't, I don't know. I don't think – I think Isaiah Jackson's going to be better, a lot better actually than Goga is, but I would still like to know what he is if I'm the Pacers before I give up on him at all. And that's a big one. That That's really tough to do though when you have Turner and Jackson still on this team and Jalen Smith who you just brought up balancing those minutes is tough. But Goga's got to play ahead of Jalen Smith. Jalen Smith plays ahead of Goga. I have lots of questions too. One more break here, guys, to talk about the good folks over at Built Bar who are making the best tasting protein bars ever. If you want to eat right, stick to your New Year's resolutions. Choose Built Bar because they are delicious candy bar tasting protein bars that are good, good for you, and come in so many awesome, delicious flavors. They have a puff variety that has like a marshmallow infusion. They have a bunch of sweet-based ones. I love the peanut butter brownie. There's a really good cookie dough one. They have some fruitier flavors, and they're all 100% covered in real chocolate, oh, even the Puffs ones, real chocolate, low-calorie, high-protein bars. You can replace your candy bars easily. You can replace a meal at work if you're looking for something quick. It's a great snack. If you're hungry, you can eat them on the go. They've got great macros all over their website for their for their health status, but most of them have 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. You have got to try them. They're all about taste over at Built Bar. Go to Built.com. Use the promo code LOCKED15 when you check out, and you'll get 15 percent off your order that promo code again is locked 15 for 15 percent off at built.com yeah all right my third thing on this list find the best good luck charm you can because they got the ping pong balls coming that's not really what i put i put maximizing losses and that's not to say throw every game i just talked about that teams don't tank but within reason you know Play the best team you can, but they, they they have I mean they have a really easy schedule for the next couple of weeks. Like Orlando twice and OK season there and a really banged up Cavs team with Karis Levert is now hurt again in there and Detroit's in there and Washington's there and San Antonio's in there, Houston's in there. This is all just in the next 25 days. You know, they could realistically go 500 or even better in the next month from when I'm talking to you. Like that, that's not crazy. And to an extent, when you have a new team, when you get Tyrese Halbert, you get Jalen Smith, you get Buddy Hield, you get a draft pick, there is an element of like set a base, get some wins. Like that's that's fine. And I don't think they can get much higher than like seventh in the lottery standings, but they, they don't, they're not going to go back to trying to be bad next year. We know Herb Simon, we know how this franchise has done it for forever. This is a once and literally for some, there will be people who live to be 60, yeah. maybe. And <laughs> the Phasers pick of the top 10 like twice, right? Like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity almost. That that's that's a stretch, but not really <laughs> for some people to see this team do well. They have to maximize one lottery and hit the draft pick. So getting a good luck charm, both for the lottery and for the draft, is important. But find making sure, I mean, they, they have to. They have to take advantage of this. They just this opportunity does not come for this franchise, and they have to take advantage of it. Yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. This is their one opportunity. Um I think I was looking at some of the other schedules. I think the Kings have a pretty tough schedule. Um, so we're, we're, uh, you know, rooting for Sabonis to, uh, to carry them. <laughs> um, so we'll be watching that closely, but they got a, they got a pretty brutal schedule um, from what I've seen. And uh, outside of that, you know, the couple teams, the Pacers are trying to stay ahead of on the backwards tankathon, you know, the, the Spurs, uh, the Pelicans, which we'll see with uh McCollum, um, they had kind of a middle of the road schedule from what I remember. So I don't know. It's a lot of it's going to come down to some head to heads, you know, um, it, might. I think it was the one of those two teams or maybe two of them play each other two or three times. So, you know, there's some losses coming in there. They've got a like maybe two and a half game lead over a couple of those teams. And then once you get down to like the Knicks range, I don't think the Pacers will be good enough to, uh, to pass them. Um, so that's, that's good news. But I mean, there's, I don't think fans realize that the difference at the top of the draft can be massive. It's not always the case, but man, if they're picking fifth compared to eighth, I mean, that's just, uh, just, it's, it's massive. And 
Um, Pritchard talked about maybe using some draft capital to move up, but ideally, if they have a little luck, as you're talking yeah. about, they don't They're have to there. do that, and they can use their assets for other in other ways as opposed to you know trying to move up a couple spots. So, yeah, it's definitely time. Yeah, so just looking at the reverse tankathon, right? And, and this is without looking at the schedule at all. This is just the quality of team. You know, they're two ahead of the Kings in sixth, and they're three and a half ahead of seventh, eighth. And that is San Antonio and New Orleans who are trying. They're trying to win. Their schedule might be harder than the Pacers, but they're trying. So how much of the trying to win and make the play in versus bad but still wants to win because they're young, but also like, come on, look what's ahead of you, is going to is gonna stack up. That's why I put the floor at like seven because I think that those teams trying is going to end up mattering. And Portland is not trying, and they've won four games in a row, so maybe they're actually good. <laughs> they have all these young scrappy dudes yeah. all of a sudden, and New York's going to try, and the Lakers are at 11. So I think seven is about the floor. If the Pacers actually look like a, a competent, like, wow, Tyrese Halliburton's awesome right now team the rest of the way. Even then, if they go 500 the rest of the season. They'll win, what, 31? Like, nine is already at 25. You know, it's, it's going to be hard for them to get out of the top seven. But, but like you said, the difference between eight and five or eight and four is still really big. The odds go up a ton at that point still. Right, your top four odds at eight – are 29% and at five or 42%. Like that's over 10%. That matters a lot. So yeah, their floor probably got a little better from the deadline, but their ceiling got a little worse. So they, 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 they just never picked this high. They have to take advantage of it. Yeah. I think Pacer fans also just remember some of those years where they had that opportunity and they get hot. So everyone is just expecting, you know, 22 Winning six in a row, right at the end finish. of the last year. Yeah. I will say to, to calm fans a little bit, if my memory serves me correctly, the, the year that they were really looking at like two, three or fourth pick and everybody wanted Evan Turner, I think it was. They ended up getting hot at the end of the year and they ended up getting Paul George at 10. So there is a probably won't happen again that way, but <laughs> there are examples like that. The NBA the NBA spares you with those uh with the luck like that. Does that right? Sometimes. What is your third and final focus for the rest of the season? Have we already covered it in some way? Um, so my third one, I I want to see this team start to build a defensive identity again. And I know that may sound a little counterintuitive because obviously if you want them to lose games, then shoot, give up 150 points a game and call it a night. But um, I do think there will be some benefit to getting a little bit of that back. I mean, I think so far in February, they're 29th in defensive rating. I think they're maybe in the mid 20s throughout the year. So nothing, they haven't been good in that area um, most of the year anyway, but especially if they do get Turner back, um, Carlisle said a couple weeks, and when he says a couple weeks, we know what that can mean. But hopefully, <laughs> if and when he comes back, and then you mix in Jackson, uh, Halliburton and Brogdon have a chance to guard the perimeter, you know, uh, and a lot better, a lot better than what we've seen throughout the year. So I, I would like to see, even though I'd like them to, to lose some games uh, and tank in that regard, I, I think there would be a little bit of benefit to have a little bit of momentum to try to get some of that back and. Uh, see if they can um, make some noise on that end. And uh, I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, you know, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't, because the roster could turn over quite a bit. But I do think there would be some benefit there. Yeah, they they traded away Karras, who, when he was guarding someone good, really liked to try on defense, but in general was not a good defender. And they traded away Jeremy Lamb, who was like one of the worst defenders I've ever seen. And Sabonis was better than he was given credit for on defense, but still at best average and Torrey Craig was a good defender but they traded away him as well they traded away three bad defenders and in theory that should make them jump up however one their whole vet of actually useful defenders were hurt right before the break and two they got Buddy Heelden, who is also a terrible defender so I think that just addition by subtraction will happen somewhat what if if they get any sort of help the rest of the way I with the Pacers you never know who's gonna who's gonna be healthy and available but I think that some of their defensive struggles will just be like, okay, we have 10 guys in the rotation who are just on average better ranking defenders in the NBA. But that said, you know, Lloyd Pierce really wanted to put his stamp on this team defensively this year. He's been in charge of a lot of that all season. Just ha it hasn't been good. And I haven't, you know, we watch the team every day. Like Bjorker and last year, there was some obvious stuff of like, oh, what are they doing? You know, there's none of that this year. That's why it's so weird. Their defensive rating is so bad. But some of it is that they just had had really weak defenders and still and Buddy and Halburn's not, you know, awesome on that end yet or anything like that either. They still have some weak defenders, so 
figuring it out with Pierce and who they have now, I think you're right, getting better at that because that's what Pritchard said is going to be their tickets being good again, right? The, what was it? Hard hat, lunch pail. There we go. Was their their identity ticket to being good again? And they have been the opposite of that this year. No hard hats. They're getting bonked on the head by falling objects all day. No lunch pails. I don't know how a lunch pail makes you tough on defense, but they need <laughs> they need something on that end. And it's been weird to see the Pacers be, what are they now, 23rd in defense? I mean, Lloyd Pierce had the defensive rating numbers memorized from the last two seasons when I talked to him in, in training camp, right? So I'm sure he knows that number. So they've got, I, it's, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. They've got to get better on that end of the floor. Yeah, at least have a direction and an identity. Um, I know, you know, probably half the fan base because of the whole Turner Sabonis thing, but, um, you know, I can't wait to see Turner back. I think it's going to be huge in, in many ways, but um, I don't expect some massive offensive jump that some people expect with Sabonis gone, but I do think a little bit of a jump there, but, just being that anchor, and I think uh, if the Pacers end of this year and then into next year, if they can obviously improve defending on the perimeter, then that's just going to make you know uh, things a whole lot easier of what they're trying to accomplish. But even if the numbers don't completely reflect it, but if you can kind of see an identity and direction what where they're headed on the defensive end, I think it'll be important for them. Yeah, even early season when they were mo- more healthy. And they were still losing, like, okay, Torrey Craig's a little nosier than anything they've had before. I'm like, oh, Duarte's a little good on defense. And, like, they had all the guys. And he, they were, like, middle of the pack around then. You know, that's not good. That's not what you want. That's not what you want when you want to win. But I, I got it then. You know, okay, they're going to be in your face and make, make it tough for you as the star of the other team. Make you make tough decisions all the time. Well, then it became, okay, Bradley, we're playing Bradley Beal. Our best option is uh, Karis LeVert. All right. You know, that, that's, that's just not going to work. So, I think we'll see some identity improvements for sure, but how much, how much that can be something that's brought into next year is definitely very important. IU basketball plays in 10 minutes, Tyler, so I don't have a lot of time left for you here. Do you have anything else you want to discuss about this team? And if not, where can people follow you and all your work? Uh, I mean, the other big thing for me is a couple of those names. We were talking before the uh, the Halliburton debut there on the sideline about the Turner, Heald, and Brogdon. How many are here next year? Um, I don't know if uh, I think at that point you're kind of saying maybe two, but I don't know which two. <laughs> and that's uh, that's kind yeah. of where a lot of fans are at right now. But I think, again, I think things are kind of rejuvenated for the fan base. There was a stretch there where it was kind of tough to cover the team at all. Um, just the the amount of backlash and, uh, you know, apathy towards the franchise. And now whether they win or lose in these last 22 games, a lot of excitement, um, which is good, a good deal. Um Fans can find me at on Twitter, Tyler Smith underscore ISL. And as you said, IndieSportsLegends.com. Uh, I do a little IU work. Uh, I was going to go there tonight, but it's nothing but ice where I live, and I got a long drive towards it. So um, we'll see if they can make the tournament. I had a bold prediction that they would, but I could be completely wrong on that. IU will find a way to let me down. I don't know what I don't know what the rest of their season looks like, but I, I expect disappointment from all IU sports. I had football. Football confidence in IU this year. That that was a life-changing moment for me. Now I know. No <laughs> IU sports ever deserve my confidence and good feelings. Tyler, thank you a ton for the time. Everybody, I'm on Twitter at T East NBA, and this podcast is at Locked On Pacers. And finally, next week, we get to talk about real games that matter and aren't just cupcake all-star games where dudes are bouncing passes off the floor in serious minutes. It's going to be fun. Plus, we'll be able to talk about like stuff we talked about today. How's the rotation now? How's Brogdon plus Halliburton? Where's the team headed? All sorts of important stuff that really matters for the long-term future of this team. It should be fantastic. Everybody follow Tyler on Twitter. Have a great weekend, and we will see you on Monday.